one, two, a one, two. I started because I saw the Beatles on television and it wasn't so much the music that grabbed me but the energy and the excitement that was surrounding them and as a eight or nine year old kid I they looked like they were having more fun than anyone I knew so I wanted to be part of that fun and eventually I gravitated towards the drums. My first drum teacher was named Tom Sicola, and this was in New Jersey. And he was 19 years old at that time and a student at the Manhattan School of Music. And one of his classmates was Steve Gadd. Oh, when I was 11 or 12 years old, I had a teacher in school, not a music teacher, but a regular teacher in school, that had some old jazz records at her house that she wanted to get rid of. And she gave me two recordings. One was the soundtrack to the Gene Krupa story, and the other one was a Max Roach recording. And the Max Roach recording, I didn't really understand. But there was something about the Gene Krupa recording that I was attracted to. And I would play along with that record almost every day and try and learn his phrases. And I remember there was one fast tempo song on there that it took me a year to, tr to be able to make it all the way through that song. Well, I think going back a little earlier, my first instrument that my parents gave me was a snare drum. And I was playing the snare drum in the house to the radio. And I guess I was doing it a lot. And my parents thought, well, if he's going to make all that noise, maybe we should get him some lessons. So that's when I studied with Tom Sicola. And I remember my lessons were $3 a half hour. And I kept, I was playing, uh, eventually I got a drum set and uh, started playing in bands when I was 13. And when I was 15, I was playing with older musicians, playing in rock bands. And I was, I, I couldn't decide what I wanted to do in life. My father wanted me to become a doctor or something like that. And at one point I was thinking maybe I would become a veterinarian. But something about music just grabbed me and I had to convince my father to, let, to allow me to go study music in school. And he had a, there was one condition and that was that I get a classical percussion degree instead of a jazz degree. And that was because he thought that if I didn't succeed as a musician, that a classical degree would have more value in the real world than a jazz degree. And, you know, he was trying to be a good father. He was trying to give me the best advice he had. But I don't think if I went to work for Apple or IBM, it wouldn't matter whether I was a failed classical percussionist or a failed jazz musician. But I started out as a classical percussion major in college and then switched to being a jazz major because drum set was always my focus. Uh, I never worked at it in a conscious way. I just like to communicate with people in the, in the most straightforward and, uh, and honest way. I had experiences with older musicians who were really encouraging me and other musicians who tried to make me recognize all my flaws. And those musicians were less inspiring to me than the musicians that were um, kind to me and gave me clear information. 
The funny thing was, I, as I said, I started out as a classical percussion major. In my third year at the university, I became a jazz major, but I was already one of the best drum set players there. And at that time, they had more freshman drummers than they had teachers for. So in my third year at the university, they hired me to teach the new students. And so from an early age, I was having interaction with these students. I think one of the, the foundations of my teaching came from my, le well, they came from my lessons with Tom Sacola, but even more from my lessons with Joe Morello, because he was a very dedicated teacher who would give very small assignments, but show you the potential if you did the work and was very inspiring uh, in that regard. And his way of communicating was really good. He said, I want to show you how to solve your own problems so you can become your own teacher. And that's the way I approach things. There's no mystery. I want to give people the right information. And then if they do the work, they can see some results. Well, I've been fortunate to, to, to meet with some young people that had a lot of potential and great hunger. Some of my students were, and some of them from, were with me for much longer and other for shorter periods, but Bill Stewart, Ari Honig, Joe Farnsworth, uh, Obed Calver, Mark Juliana, Dan Weiss, um, there's so many that I'm, uh, forgetting. But I think really the question is what was common among these guys because they all play differently. And my idea as a teacher is not to show you how to play like me or how to play a certain way, but to help you find your own voice in the straightest line. Because you can take a lot of detours and the thing that I found that was common among these guys, and this may sound strange for me to say, but the thing that was common was that they didn't need me. They were on a mission and they were gonna get there somehow. The interaction perhaps with me made the road a little straighter. And that's my idea, not to make you into something, but to help you become yourself. Well, the old saying is that music is a language. And, you know, how do you learn to speak your language? At first, you, you copy the sounds you hear your parents make before those sounds actually have any meaning. You know, you hear mama, and then eventually you know that that's her. And doggy, and eventually you know that that's the dog. And the... And so if your parents are scientists, maybe you have a certain language uh, vocabulary as a, as a child. If your parents are uh, chefs, maybe you're familiar with a different language. The, the, uh, the beautiful thing about music is you can pick your parents. And it's really important to pick parents that are wise. And so the reason we still find Papa Joe Jones and Philly Joe Jones and Max Roach intriguing to listen to is because there's a clarity in their playing that displays the dialect of jazz. And you, you know, I can play a rock beat that doesn't make me a rock musician. I need to know how John Bonham would vary that, and how Charlie Watts would vary that, and how Ringo would vary that, and how Carmine Apice would vary that. And so studying the people that are experts in that music, whether it's jazz or rock, 
uh, is informative. Now, when rock came along, there were no rock drummers. There were jazz drummers who modified what they knew to fit the new uh, formation. A lot of the innovations in drumming come from adapting to changes that other musicians make in the way the music sounds. And then we morph what we play to fit the new situation. And the perfect example is the rock beat. So before that, we had the swing beat. And then when you hear the first rock records, the drummers are still playing swing, but they turn it into a shuffle. And that's because of what the piano player is doing. The piano player is playing. And the, the swing beat becomes a shuffle beat. There's a, a legend, I don't know if it's true, that on one recording with the drummer Earl Palmer and the piano player Little Richard, they made a recording and Earl Palmer listens to the playback and he says, something's wrong. And he listens more carefully and he recognizes that Little Richard changed his pattern from to and Earl Palmer says, oh, I've got to flatten out my shuffle. And that became the rock beat. So the innovation was made by the piano player and the drummer made an adaptation of that. And so we're always growing from the information that happened before. And since rock came from jazz and funk came from rock and hip hop came from funk, if you want to know more about each of these things, go back and see what was happening before you. And a lot of times the innovations are, are smaller than you think. That um, the newest guy playing the newest thing is actually playing something that happened before but leaving one note out or adding three notes to it. So if you want to be informed about how the instrument and the playing of the instrument evolved, you need some foundation in what happens. You don't have to learn to play like Max Roach, but a lo an awful lot of what people play today, Max Roach was playing in 1947. So I think that's the value in going back. You become a wiser player now. Well, listening is really important. We can learn from books, but really, I think books have to be a supplement to listening rather than books be the important thing and listening be the supplement. Um, I would suggest listening to a record called Miles Davis All Stars with Kenny Clark playing drums on it. I think it's from 1953. And they play some songs like Bag's Groove and some real medium tempo swing songs. And there's a great bass player named per Percy Heath. And try and copy the cymbal beat of Kenny Clark on that record. Or Art Blakey playing the song called Moanin. Um, or Philly Joe Jones playing Straight No Chaser with Miles Davis. And the first thing is to get the swing feeling on the cymbal. And then everything else is extra. This is where the meat and potatoes are, as we say. And everything else is the, the, the gravy and the vegetables and the dessert. But really, if this is happening, you almost don't need any of that other stuff. So get it from Get it from Kenny Clark, from Philly Joe Jones, from Art Blakey, from Papa Joe Jones. And 
that will inform you about the feeling of the music and the way the drummer interacts with the other musicians.